Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Paul Mason. Uh, some of you know me from this morning. As with all of my lectures, uh, this does not constitute medical advice, but to an audience of doctors, that's probably less relevant. The talk today is about how to read blood tests. And there's a little bit more nuance to it than we often think. And some of this nuance comes in with regards to what we call the reference ranges. So this is an example of a biochemistry panel. And down the right hand side, you can see the standardised reference ranges. And you can see two values for each test, a lower limit and an upper reference limit. And ostensibly, this is a good idea. And if we have a value that's outside of this range, it gets highlighted with an asterisk. And that's usually when the doctor will start to be concerned about it. So it's almost a, a binary thing. It's like, no asterisk, you're all good. Oh, there's an asterisk there. Something bad's going to happen to you. Sometimes, though, confidence in these reference ranges is entirely unjustified. So let's take a story from 1970. So this is a common sight on a beach in Australia. There's crowds of people which are sunbathing. But by 1980, there was huge concern over high rates of skin cancer, and that led to publicly funded campaigns to discourage sun exposure. And you'll probably remember these iconic ads which were first launched in 1981. This is Sid the Seagull. Just say the simple word. Slip, slop, slap. It sounds like a breeze when you say it like that. Slip. And this has now come down to influence all of our behaviour in Australia. For most of the year in Australia, students can't go outside without a broad brimmed hat and sunscreen. And one inadvertent result of this has been a lowering of UV exposure leading to lower vitamin D levels. And that can actually lead to impairment of bone health. And there's a condition, it used to be something of a Victorian era disease called rickets. Um, but in recent years, there's been something of a resurgence. Now, one of the earliest markers for this condition is something called ALP, which reflects bone turnover. And as you can see, we've got a nice bell curve for much of it, but looking down the right there, you can see that there's a few individuals there in this population which are very, very clear outliers. And because alkaline phosphatase is involved in mineralisation and growth, um, you know, that can have significant consequences if it's elevated for young children. Now, I can't give a reference for this, but I will tell you I have it on very good authority. One of the uh, Australian blood laboratories, up until recently, for one of their paediatric age groups, they had a threshold for alkaline phosphatase <laughs> that was set at a non-diagnostic threshold. Basically, it, wasn't, it was set too high. So there was all these raised ALPs coming in, but they weren't being flagged. And this was only identified when there was an overseas fellow to this laboratory who looked at the threshold and said, oh, well, back home, we actually use this as a threshold because when you've got that, you're gonna miss X percent of cases. And in fact, when they actually did reduce the threshold, they actually started picking up a whole lot more cases. So when did this happen? Remember that the whole SunSmart campaign was released in 1981? This was 2013. So this really serves to highlight the arbitrariness of some reference ranges and should alert you to the possibility, perhaps sometimes you need to take them with a grain of salt. So if you see this on your blood test, you know, don't take it as gospel. It's a bit like the flags at the beach, if we continue with this scenario. They're only as good as their placement. And you should assume that they've been put out by the work experience kid. They might not be in the best location. So sometimes staying between the flags is not always the best place to be. Now, one of the difficulties of setting reference ranges is that for most blood parameters, there's quite a spread of results between individual, different individuals, and there's no clear cutoff. And the most common way of setting reference ranges is based on the range of values 
in 95% of the population. So saying something's within normal limits, which what these reference ranges often do, doesn't mean a lot because you're being compared against the larger population. You want to be compared against the healthy population. But do you think that 95% of people out there are especially healthy? You're being compared against some individuals who aren't, they don't look that good really. So uh, there's some things, some reference measures which are tightly controlled. So if we take pH for instance, and that's obviously going to be quite tightly regulated. Um, but for a lot of the things as we're going to see, it doesn't hold. Now there's also the concept of biological variation. Basically the results on any one test of an individual will fluctuate around a homeostatic set point. And we used to think that there was a lot of biological variation, but the more recent research um, will actually show that the biological variation, the day-to-day -day results, and this is even the stuff that's induced by lab error and things that analytical error, um, is actually a lot smaller than we used to think about it. So this is one study here, and you can see that the erythrocyte variation, so each individual here, they had blood tests, so this is a, a 10 repeat blood tests, and you can see that the variation for each individual is quite a lot less than the reference range which is delineated by the dashed lines. So it's more accurate if you have historical results for a patient, compare their current results to their previous results rather than comparing it to the reference range, especially if they've got <coughs> previous blood tests that were performed when they were healthy. So in this situation here, we're actually looking at haemoglobin and you can see this is a pretty typical result of somebody who's maintaining their health in a pretty stable state. There's very, very little variation. Now, another, this is another example of where trends is useful. So we can see the TSH here. And we can see for the first three results on the left, there's very little variation. And then this one on the 21st of July last year, it jumps a lot it's still well within the reference range. So without that asterisk, most patients would be told by their doctors they have nothing to worry about. But when I saw this, I thought, that just looks a little bit funny. And this is what we found, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So well within the reference range, but you can see a dramatic difference. So following trends when you're interpreting blood tests is very useful. Now, something that can catch you out as well. We've all had patients come in occasionally, rarely, and they tell us their blood collectors had difficulty getting blood. Venisection was a little bit difficult. And in this situation, we can often have what's called hemolysis of the blood sample. What that means is that these red blood cells will basically burst open. And the chemicals which are found in the red blood cells will leak into the plasma, into the serum, and will start getting distortion of our results. So. These are the results here, and I've highlighted four uh, common intracellular items that are found in erythrocytes, or red blood cells, that will be often be increased. And we often see this quite prominently. So keep an eye out for this. If you see somebody coming in with a funny blood result, and it seems to be these four that are elevated, consider that it might be hemolysis from a difficult draw. Now, this patient, all we do is, oh, let's do another blood test next week. And you can see normalisation of everything. There's reductions in all of those. Now, we didn't fix it all in the week. All it was that we didn't have hemolyzed red blood cells.